the original show with the heart, Strike It Rich. Presented by Fair, the new formula Fair, with more active than any other leading product. For the third week, Mr. Hill Fame and his rent of $116,000. It was the 1950s, and the television was quickly becoming the center of the modern American household. Entire markets had risen alongside the popularity of the television, with the TV dinner quickly becoming an American staple alongside it. Murphy, lucky me! My wife uses Swanson TV turkey dinners. And make your husband lucky, too. Get Swanson TV turkey dinners, Swanson TV fried chicken dinners, Swanson TV beef dinners from your grocer's big freezer. With this rise came the need to keep entertainment fresh, as with only a handful of networks, there was an intense fight for viewers. From this need came the rise of the quiz show, a type of program that had been popular during the age of radio and was also cheap and easy to produce. There arose a number of experiments with quiz shows of this nature with the $64,000 question becoming the first and only program to dethrone the legendary I Love Lucy from the top spot in the ratings. At one point, there were over 20 different quiz programs on the air at one time. Something made more impressive when you realize that there were only four networks and 24-hour television channels didn't yet exist. The quiz show craze seemed to have America in a chokehold, as famously, even United States President Dwight D. Eisenhower instructed members of his staff that he should not be disturbed during the time his favorite quiz show was being aired. In September of 1956, a new quiz show challenger came onto the scene in the form of the game show 21 on NBC. Gentlemen, welcome back to 21. That thunderous reception from our studio audience indicates that both of you are well liked by all audiences and having a hard job and it failed to win on the, miserably on how do you feel tonight Hank with 160 but this wasn't due to the fact that the market was saturated as other new shows were doing much better rather it was the fact that 21 was built different and it was built as the first quiz show that would be played without any influence or manipulation by the show's producers the game itself was simple Two players would be placed in their own isolation booths, facing away from each other, and given a pair of headphones. Neither player inside the studios can hear anything un until I turn the studios on with these switches, nor can they see anybody in the studio audience or hear the applause. I'll turn the studios on right now. Can you hear me all right, Hank? Very well, thanks. And how about you, Harold? Yes, I can. All right, fellas. Uh, a big one's coming up, so give yourself a moment or so to calm down, and we'll get right on with the game. Whenever one booth would be active, the other would be off meaning the player in that booth could not hear anything and their microphone would also be inactive. Harold, I think you know the object. You have to get to 21 as fast as you possibly can by answering questions graded from 1 to 11. The 11s and 10s and 9s are the more seriously hard. The 1s, 2s and 3s are a little easier. And here is the first category. Novels. Novels. How many points do you want from 1 to 11? You grade yourself. Uh, I'll shoot the works on this and I'll try 11. You go the, all the way. The most difficult question, 11 points. All right, Harold, we know you read a lot and you're taking a chance on this one. Here you are for 11 points. The host would then give the player in the activated booth a series of questions with different point values between 1 and 11. A correct answer to a question would award the player the points, but a wrong answer would subtract those points from their score adding to a risk and reward element. The goal of the game was to reach a score of 21, the name of the show, first. Two or three weeks ago, 
Prince, uh, Prince, uh, Prince Juan, uh, Prince Juan Carlos, or Carlo. I don't care how you say it, you've just scored 21 points. <laughs> now, Harold, I'm going to ask you to please be very quiet. Do not divulge your score. You have 21. Hank has to have his turn to go. I'm going to let you listen, but don't speak. Hank Bloomgarten, you have 10 points. The category is kings. How many points do you want from 1 to 11? I'll try for, tw for 21. Uh, 11 points. That's 11 the most points. difficult question. Try for 21. Hank, I can tell you now, as I always do, I think it is fair to tell you, that Harold Craig has scored 21 points. If you answer correctly, we'll have another tie, and we'll have to play an additional game at $2,500 a point. If you miss, well, I'm not going to bother to figure it out. After two rounds, both isolation pods would be activated, and the players would be given the option of stopping the game. If a player chose to end the game, the player with the most points would be declared the winner. If no player chooses to end the game, rounds would continue until a maximum of five were complete. The winner, who had won the most rounds, would win a large cash prize that they then could leave with or choose to stay on as champion for the next show to earn more money. The host would also give the winner a small hint about who they would be playing in the next game. Perhaps it might be a teacher, a doctor, a bricklayer, an educator, before the winner made their choice to leave or play. But if the winner chose to come back for another game and lost, the new winner's cash winnings would be deducted from the losing champion making for a fairly exciting prospect and a great reason to tune back in to the show again and again. I'm going to run along here a little fast. You've got $10,000. Now, you can keep on playing if you want, or you can take that $10,000 and quit. It's entirely up to you. Before you make up your mind, I think that you should come back next week, meet your next opponent, hear something about your next opponent, and then tell us whether you want to take your $10,000 and quit or continue playing for... Who knows how much? Is that all right with you? Right. You've done wonderfully tonight, Jim Bowser. We'll look forward to seeing you next week here on 21. Good night. Now this premise for a show, one that's been repeated over the years in various forms, is solid. So why did it initially fail? Well, during the show's first episode, the two contestants selected had such poor knowledge of the questions asked that they constantly got the answers wrong. This made the contestants look uneducated. It also made for a boring and very slow show. But most importantly, it made the show sponsor furious. This is Geritol, the high potency tonic that helps you feel stronger fast, presents 21. The show sponsor demanded that something be done to save the show as they did not want to see such a sad display on television again. So, the show's producers obliged and quickly made changes to 21. Now, following episodes were much more engaging and featured what seemed like stronger and more interesting contestants turning an almost failed program into a big hit for the network. After only three months of being on the air, 21 had its very own Ken Jennings sort of winner in one Herb Stemple. You see, Stemple was the perfect contestant, or so it seemed. He was the prototypical All-American, fighting to get by and just looking for a chance to better themselves and the position of their family. Now, Stemple appeared on the program for six consecutive weeks, outperforming all challengers during that time. It wouldn't be until he faced one Charles Van Doren an acclaimed writer and an English instructor at Columbia University, that he would fall from his champion seat in a huge televised event. Van Doren seemed like the perfect match for Stemple, with his impressive collegiate background at one of the country's most prestigious universities, alongside being in a family full of Pulitzer Prize winning authors. But you see, it was all set up from the beginning. Enter one Dan Enright, one of 21's producers, who decided to drop the hands-off approach of the show 
that was pitched to the network. He took it upon himself to create the show that the sponsors wanted by coaching the contestants and setting the crowd favorites to win and go on these small streaks until ratings began to falter. And this was the case with Stimple. You see, his run on the show lasted for so long because the crowd loved him and connected with him as a player and a person. But after six weeks, the show began to see its ratings drop, and Enright knew that America was beginning to grow tired of seeing Stemple win over and over again. Good evening, I'm Jack Barry. Tonight here on 21, Herbert Stemple, our 29-year-old GI college student, can win $111,500 the highest amount of money ever to be won on television. But to do this, he's risking much of the money he has won thus far. So right now, let's meet our first two players as Geritol, America's number one tonic, presents 21. And so Enright found Van Doren, the seemingly perfect contestant to come in and topple Stemple and take over the champion's chair. And so Stemple took the fall as instructed in front of an audience of some 15 million people who tuned in to see if Stemple would win $100,000 on that night's episode. In total, Stemple had won nearly $70,000 on the program during his six-week run as champion before that eventual loss. But while Stemple took the fall and now had a fairly large sum of money to his name at the time, the forced loss would not sit with him well. You see, Stemple knew from the very beginning that he would someday have to fall as Enright had paid Stemple a visit at his home shortly after his interview to be on the show and asked him a very simple question. How would you like to make $25,000? Stemple understood what this meant and that his time on 21 had a finite shelf life. Everything about Stemple's performance, his appearance, and his background was coached and created during his winning streak on the show. Stemple would be given answers to the questions to study prior to each show, but was also instructed in how to give those answers in order to heighten the drama. His look was even tailor-made for him, in order to look worse for television so that viewers could better connect with him, often wearing ill-fitting suits as well as an old, slow, and loud watch that could be picked up on the studio microphones. And even his background was altered, the host telling the audience that Stemple was a nearly homeless veteran whose family had fallen onto hard times and who was working to not only take care of them, but also pay for college so that he could better provide for his family. But the reality was that Stemple was a clean-cut man who had seen success on legitimate quiz shows as a kid and who went on to serve in the military, even seeing action in the tail end of World War II. He later took a good job with the post office before marrying and returning to college on the GI Bill. Still, Stemple seemingly had it made post-loss on the show as not only did he walk away with a lot of money, but Enright also promised him a job at NBC for taking the fall. But as the weeks went by, Stemple began to resent Enright, and particularly in the manner in which he was asked to take the fall, over a question about which film had won the Academy Award for Best Picture in 1955. I knew that the answer was Marty, but Enright specifically wanted me to miss that question. This hurt me very deeply because this was one of my favorite pictures of all time and I could never forget this. A few seconds before that, as I was trying to come up with the answer, I could have changed my mind. I could have said, the answer is Marty instead of on the waterfront. I would have won. There would have been no Charles Van Doren, no famous celebrity. Charles Van Doren would have gone back to teaching college and my whole life would have been changed. On that day, I was due to lose to Van Doren. I sat home, watching television in the morning. Every few minutes, an announcement would break on WNBC saying, 
is Herb Snapple going to win $100,000 tonight? And I said, no, he's not going to win $100,000. He's going to take a dive. Stemple would go so far as to claim that after his loss, he even overheard someone in the back who worked on the show tell another co-worker that, at least we finally have a clean-cut intellectual on this program, and not a freak with a sponge memory. Now by this point, it had been about a year since his loss, and during that time, as it so happens, Stemple was again a nobody. He was now forced to watch as Van Doren became the most popular contestant the show had ever seen, with America forgetting who Stemple even was. Van Doren, of course, was the perfect contestant with the perfect background, and one that didn't need to be coached, even though he still was and got the answers prior to appearing. He didn't need to be molded in the same manner as Stemple was. Now eventually the letters from friends, from family, and those around him stopped coming in heaping praise on Stemple. And then finally, Stemple's cash winnings ran out. By this time Stemple was graduating from college and looked to Enright to make good on his promise to find a place for him on another NBC show as he had promised. Now this was something that actually happened to Van Doren when he lost as he would go on to become an NBC commentator, even having a place on the Today Show. But Enright never honored this agreement with Stemple, saying that he had sold his shows to NBC and that he could no longer make anything happen for him at the network. Now it's claimed that Enright did later tell Stemple that he would find a spot for him on another panel show if he signed a binding statement that said Stemple was never coached on the show 21. But even then, a show opening would never materialize. And so, Stemple went public with his claims of 21 being rigged. A reporter for the New York City Journal American took the story and believed Stemple's allegations, but he was prevented from publishing his findings. You see, it seems that the paper was afraid of a potential libel lawsuit from a major television network that could potentially ruin them. The paper refused to go public with the story as they only had the testimony of Stemple and did not have any other corroborating evidence. And so 21 continued and other shows would come onto the air that used the same deceptive tactics to create fake winners. It wouldn't be until several other cases came to light before any major action would be taken against these shows in the networks. You see, in 1956, on another NBC quiz show called The Big Surprise... The Big Surprise! Presented by the Purex Corporation's family of products for your family. Wonderful new Beads of Bleach. Trend Detergent, the brand the smart girls buy. And new blue Dutch cleanser with exclusive blue magic action. And here's your $100,000 host, Mike Wallace. A contestant went on to sue the production company behind the show, demanding that they be reinstated as a contestant. Their case claimed that the contestant in question was asked a question that they did not know the answer to during a warm-up session. Now when this happens, usually that question is removed, but that question would then be asked again live on air in an attempt to force the contestant to lose on that night's program. Now in another case, it was discovered that a backup contestant on the quiz show known as Dotto had found a notebook that contained all the answers to the questions asked to the show's then champion. And even 21, for its part, was not immune from the allegations, as another contestant had seemingly written down all the questions and their answers for an upcoming program, and had mailed them back to his home prior to air. Now this is important because he did so via registered letters, giving the very first solid piece of evidence that producers on 21 were manipulating the outcome. Now following these instances, the public began to catch wind, and the popularity of the quiz show 
dropped quickly, leading to the shows in question being cancelled or pulled off the air. And by late 1958, in December, a grand jury was convened to look into these allegations. Witnesses were brought in, including Stemple, and told their stories of essentially being paid off to lose and how they were given the answers to questions prior to playing. Meanwhile, several of the show's winners, who were coached, refused to come forward and risk the backlash of admitting to any form of cheating, as they had since become minor celebrities. Likewise, many producers who rigged these shows kept silent, so as to be able to continue to work in television, as well as not implicate the show's sponsors or networks. After a nine-month-long investigation, and after nearly all quiz shows had been taken off the air during, no indictments were handed down. It wouldn't be until late 1959 when the House Subcommittee on Legislative Oversight held their own hearings on the scandals, but as no specific laws existed regarding game show fraud, they found that nothing could be done. Now, in the end, the committee would amend the Communications Act to officially ban the fixing of television quiz shows that were based on intellectual knowledge or skill. That bill would be signed into law by President Eisenhower, himself a quiz show fan, into law on September 13, 1960. But what happened to Herb Stemple and Charles Van Doren, the two men that helped kick off this entire episode? Well, initially, Van Doren denied the accusations. His popularity was such at the time that he had gone from contestant to commentator at NBC, so he was quite popular. After stating he knew nothing, he would go into hiding for a time to avoid an official subpoena and pressure from his bosses at NBC to come forward before finally coming out and sitting before Congress. He stated, I was involved, deeply involved, in a deception. The fact that I, too, was very much deceived cannot keep me from being the principal victim of that deception, because I was its principal symbol. Soon after this, Van Doren would then be let go from NBC, as well as resign from his teaching position at Columbia. He would continue to write and edit using a pen name at first, and eventually working for a time at Encyclopedia Britannica. Van Doren would shy away from the limelight post-hearing, and did not give any interviews regarding his quiz show past. He went as far as to leave the country for a time during the release of the 1994 movie Quiz Show directed by Robert Redford, a film based on those events. The movie would go on to be nominated for several Academy Awards, including Best Picture, upon release. Charles Van Doren died on April 9, 2019. He was 93 years old. For his part, Herb Stemple would finish college and would go to work for the New York City Transportation Department for several decades. In 1994, Stemple would make his movie debut in that Robert Redford-directed quiz show, playing a 21 contestant being interviewed by Congress. Stemple would embrace the renewed interest in himself in the scandal and would give several interviews during the release of the film, even once appearing on Late Night with Conan O'Brien. Herb Stemple died on April 7th of 2020. He was also 93 years old. For their part, quiz shows would never quite recover with many networks completely cutting them from their programming schedules for good. It would not be until Jeopardy that the quiz show would see a revival and a drastic format change with lower money earnings and with the answers now being given first allowing the audience to get in on the fun. And it wouldn't be until Who Wants to Be a Millionaire in the 2000s that the big money quiz show would return in its more original format, some 40 years after the day that every quiz show went off the air. Thanks for sticking with us and watching this video. If you liked what you saw, the best thing you can do to help us grow is to like, comment, subscribe, and share this video around. We do our best to bring you a lot of interesting, 
weird and fun content here on the channel. And in 2024, we look to bring you even more than we did last year. With that said, we hope you guys have a fantastic day, evening, whatever it may be, wherever you may be. And we'll see you again in the next video.